I've thought about every disability I could get, and I think about the version of what I'd do if I had that condition. I thought, like, what if I go to prison? What if I get a, what if I get, and what if I lose, like, my lower half? What if, what if I, I don't know, what if I, like, can't grow hair anymore? For years, y'all have been asking for Anthony to be the one getting interviewed. Well, in this episode of Assumptions, we sit him down with other OG YouTubers. Now let's get into it. OG YouTubers felt pigeonholed into one form of content. I think that's actually true. For you? Uh, for me, I mean, I, I feel like at the time, it was super risky to take risks. It was like, one one risk pushing it too far might turn your audience away. It felt like it felt like YouTube was really fragile and the audience was a little fickle at the time. But I think that was just a feeling. I think, you know, experimenting with other types of things, there people did appreciate that. And I think it was just like a, a fear or something of like, if I change things up too much, then people might stop watching. I tried a lot. I tried being a vlog channel before my channel blew up. I tried being a lot of different types of a channel, but it wasn't until I started doing just what I really loved. I loved playing the character. I love, I mean, playing characters is one of my favorite things to do. I would do it if I was on another planet. I would find a way to like play other characters <laughs> and film it. So, so when I just kind of gave in and really started doing what I authentically love, that's what started blowing up. And yeah. it was like, it was almost like mm -hmm. people I felt could sense that this is coming from a more genuine part of me than just like me trying to vlog a life that I wasn't living. I was, I, you know, cause I would never vlog my actual boring life. So it was just this false, you know, and I was like, no one's gonna watch that. But then I started playing these fictitious characters. And mm -hmm. in a way, it's like, I, I just appealed to more people with the mask on. And I think I've always kind of liked that version of storytelling long before YouTube existed. It's weird because I, especially when I was first starting out, I did not feel pigeonholed at all because I had my personal channel, Danebo, and I was just doing whatever kind of random stuff I wanted to. It was a lot of like sketch, you know, like very cheesy special effects. That was my favorite thing in the world. And every, you know, couple of weeks I would just do something random and new and that was fun and exciting, but I didn't really have any kind of direction. So like some things would do pretty well and then some things would just fall flat and I just kind of never, I never had a true direction until I made Annoying Orange and then that kind of blew up and became its own kind thing. Kind of blew up? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't that episode have like 250 million views? Yeah. <laughs> All right, it blew up. <laughs> Creating content now just feels like a chore for OG YouTubers. I think it can. Yes. I think if you don't switch it up, if you get stuck in routine and cycle, kind of like you're just producing the same stuff over and over and over again without taking any risks or changing it. And yeah. especially if your goal is only like, I got to hit my number, got to hit my benchmark. But I think after a certain point, OG YouTubers have learned after being on the platform for so long that you, you kind of have to, to switch things up. You can't get so caught up in just making stuff in order to hit a number. Yeah, you, you have gotta to make it for it. yourself. You have to, and, and I feel like a lot of us have went through a portion of time where we were super burnt out just making it because we felt like we had to. Yeah. I don't know, have you, have you dealt with that? Well, you know, it's funny. We did an interview years ago where we talked about this mm -hmm. with uh, Ryan, Ryan Higa, I think, yeah. and that interview, Anthony, has haunted me. Wait, why? why? Ever since, because I kept thinking to myself, well, if it happened to him, when's it yeah. gonna happen to me? Yeah, because Ryan, he, got, he was like, he's like, I am just so f It, it, it horrified oh, wow. me. I had a hard time watching his coverage for the, just because I was, I'm, I'm terrified of the same thing. <laughs> Here's the thing, I, I have not been burnt out of it yet. I have not felt burnt out. I don't, I don't, I, my fans, ever since the dawn of my channel, I've never created a, a facilitated, a, a um, I've never had a set routine upload schedule. Yeah. And I've been blessed in that sense of like, I've never set the stipulation of like, all right, every week you're getting content. But um, no, I mean, maybe that's that's the balance is that I don't have that pressure of getting stuff out as much, so I don't fall out of mm. love with it as much. But um, I still keep waiting for the day. I still keep waiting <laughs> for the day it's gonna happen. I know for myself, like when, each time I do a new video, I try and do some kind of like new element or like new effect or something that I haven't done before just mm -hmm. to kind of keep teaching myself new things um, and keep it interesting. Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest thing, you know, because I still 
that's the aspect I, I, aspect I still love about it. What's, what's some of the weirdest stuff you've brought to life? I just, I have to. <laughs> <laughs> like the weirdest objects? Yeah. Or what? Like some of the weirdest <laughs> things you gave eyes to. Oh man, um, sh any piece of food that you can think of, we've probably done. It's, is it all edible stuff or are there? No, I mean like there's water towers and whatever. You, a water tower episode? Yes, yeah. Oh my God. But also it's, it's, it's just dependent on the episode. Like, yeah. you know, characters could be eating a bag of chips, but then there's also a bag of chips that is a character <laughs> in the same so scene. Eating the brains out of it. Yeah, exactly. I, it's crazy, because even just now sitting across from you, looking into your eyes, I'm like, those are the eyes. <laughs> Like, I can see it. Like, this is the mouth. For me, it's the teeth. Yeah, yeah. I'm like, those are the crazy. The most famous mouth on YouTube. Yeah. Well, you know I mean, your, your your face is strangely uniquely iconic to the world. <laughs> I'll take it. I'll it's take so it. Crazy. It is crazy. I can. I, I'm like now seeing the orange start to come out, and I'm like, saying, oh yeah, okay, there it is. <laughs> Change the, you. Yeah. yeah slowly, yeah. the voice will we'll, we'll see. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Starts laughing. Like, yes. Annoying words. Oh, <laughs> yeah. oh my god. <laughs> Power of Jake Rock says that OG YouTubers regret pushing themselves as hard as they did at their YouTube peak. I don't regret pushing myself so hard. I, I have learned from that that you don't need to push yourself so hard in order to remain successful or to keep up momentum. I had a fear at that time that if I pulled back in any way, then I would lose it all. I was gonna say I had all six cylinders going and, I'm, yeah. and I knew it was sink or swim. I knew when I was popping off Okay, just we gotta put back yeah. on all, this is priority number one. I gotta make sure, cause you don't know if you're gonna have that, that wave of success again. Yeah. So I like, I exhausted myself, I didn't sleep, I didn't, for like good, a good five months, I was just <laughs> cranking out content. But you don't regret it. And I don't regret it, because <laughs> I probably wouldn't be sitting here now if I, if I didn't do that. What was it like, like when you knew that you were popping off, did it, was it a, like a sink or swim kind of moment for you too, or? Yeah, definitely. I, I very much realized pretty quickly, just based on watching other people's stuff, that man, you really have to stick to a schedule. Yeah. And that for, for Orange, I kind of like, in the beginning, I was like, every Friday, that's when a new episode was gonna drop. And so that's, you know, I dedicated myself to that. And I think, you know, in the long run, that's what made it ses successful, but. There was a lot, like you yeah. said, a lot of sleepless nights, a yeah. lot of, you know, not sleeping. Um, Finishing videos at thir uh, you know Thursday night at 4 a.m. right before mm -hmm. upload, you know mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So I think the thing is that we learned how much effort needs to go into creating the stuff that we create, but now we've learned to work smarter, not harder. Yes. And for me personally, it's like hiring the team to help get those things done, teaching people how to do a lot of the elements that someone else could probably do better than I can mm. and more efficiently than I can and having them do those elements so I get to focus on the things that I feel like only I could do or just that I love doing and still create stuff with the same momentum as before but without killing myself to do it. Brandon has a top secret basement full of starved writers and producers that he sucks the energy juices out of to make such amazing content all the time. Uh-oh. Um, I would like to know how they found this out. <laughs> uh, I wish I wouldn't be so lonely. Because <laughs> you'd be so busy sucking their uh, sucking souls. Sucking the starving, the, the I, <laughs> yeah, with the juices. What? All, the, all, these, <laughs> yeah, the juices? all these skinny withered legends down in my basement. Uh, I love doing it. Oh, I have no life. I guess that, that's, that's, those are all the demons in my basement. They're all just like the boring nights I've had. But all everyone I look up to, stays in, it doesn't, doesn't have any FOMO about really staying in on most Friday or Saturday nights and just yeah. doing what they need to get done. I think there's a lot of um, something to admire with just staying in and being all of the soul sucked uh, <laughs> uh, the, little or the orphans. What's up? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Yeah, we've moved on to orphans <laughs> now. Orphans <laughs> now. Very talented orphans. <laughs> You've orphaned them. <laughs> oh my God. I assume that Dane is truly embracing their identity and feeling much more free, fulfilled, and more joy than they have in a while. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree. Um, it's been like eight or nine years since I've actually been in front of the camera and done interviews. And a big part of that was just, I was not comfortable with myself. And I was just going through so much stuff personally. Um, I mean, a big part of the reason that I got into making videos was to distract myself from my identity. 
Oh. Oh, wow. You know, like I, I've come out as trans to uh, some of my, you know, more intimate family, friends, that sort of thing. Um, I've been on estrogen for a year and a half now. Uh, I'm still very much in the, the early stages of everything. And I don't know where it's going to take me, but I know that it's right for me. Mm. But I spent so much of my time trying to distract myself from all of that. And that's why I loved making videos because I could create this whole world and distract myself. And in this world, I can control everything and I don't have to worry about it. But it's kind of nice now as I've, I've, I've done a lot of therapy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I've found a way to love myself in a way that I never have before. And it's kind of nice now to be able to create stuff just for the fun of it. And it's not a distraction anymore. Do you think that orange is ever going to transition? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Is orange gender? Does he have a, does he? Okay. So, I mean, this is this has been a big topic of conversation <laughs> with the fans for yeah, a very yeah. long time. But Marshmallow the is a character who is kind of like the Pat character in Saturday Night Live. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Are they a boy? Are they a girl? Right, right. And we finally settled it a couple years ago. We made an episode where Marshmallow comes out as non-binary. And to some degree, it was a little bit of a reflection of my own coming out. I've kind of realized, hey, I've got this platform. I want people to know. And I want, I just want people to know it's okay. Mm -hmm. You know? So you've answered Marshmallow, but orange. Orange. <laughs> orange is definitely like, heteronormative. <laughs> I don't, you know, like yeah. he has a crush on passion fruit, but he doesn't really think about romance that much. Mm, I think fucking. he just doesn't know how, like how to process his feelings in that way, which is why he makes a lot of like inappropriate jokes. Mm. And he thinks he's being funny, yeah. but he doesn't realize that everyone around him doesn't think he's funny. I assume that at some point, OG YouTubers considered retiring. Yes, absolutely. There was many conversations I had with big wigs about selling Annoying Orange. Oh. But the, it was definitely at a point, a low point, when there was a lot of things going wrong in my career, my personal life, and it was, I was just so overwhelmed. I was like, I, I just gotta do something. And I you know, went and talked to people about it, but at the end of the day, I kinda came back around and I was like, you know what, I can't, this is my baby. You know, mm. I, I love it, so. How close were you to, to making that decision? Not very close. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, not very close. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's still tantal. I mean, it's still like, oh, there's someone who, there, there's an option to sell this and. Yeah. You know, it's rare that anyone has the privilege of loving what they do or that much, you know, especially something that they, you know, we spend so much time on this stuff. I can't imagine not fully loving it, you know? Right. I feel like you're never gonna retire. No. no. <laughs> No. No, I thought What I've would thought you do about, with yourself? I've thought about every disability I could get. Like, what if I lose a leg? What if I lose this? Go blind, go deaf, the ding, ding, ding. And I think about the version of what I'd do if I had that condition. Right, right. right. Like, you'll, you'll, be able, you'll be able to continue creating content no matter what. I happens. thought, like, what if I go to prison? What if I go to. <laughs> what if I get. And what if I lose, like, my lower half? What if. What if I. I don't know. What if I, like, can't grow hair anymore? And whatever. I'm in wigs all the time. I'm in a. And, and, uh. Yeah, like I, I just I I think about it because I don't like you know you have certain professions like let's say uh, a brain surgeon you know you break your hands right True. you know yeah I it's scary to think that like oh I could fall out of love with this or or stop doing this because of any reason um, I yeah I, I'm never gonna retire but but I but I am scared of something preventing me from doing what I love and right. so so. Uh, I don't think anything can. I have to be pretty f dead to stop doing <laughs> to stop doing this. The only way you're not doing it is if you're in a coma. Or I, just, dead. I just love And doing even it. then we'll step in and we'll, you know, we'll do the I filming. Hope you do. And, yes. <laughs> It'll just be shots of your body in a coma. People yeah. love it. I've never thought about actually retiring in the moment, but I have fantasized about a future where I retire. And I don't know if I'll ever actually get there, but even selling Smosh in 2011, it was like with the idea of like, oh, when I'm like super old, like in my yeah. like 36 years old, I'll, I'll be able to, I'll be able to retire. I'll That's probably young. when I'll want it. But now I, I, I'm here and I see like, I, I just love doing this. I love making things. I love creating things. I love seeing the way that it impacts people. I love seeing the positive positive effect that you can have just through this little screen and it can affect potentially millions of people in a positive way. I, I it's 
I just enjoy it. I love it. Yeah, so I was gonna say, yeah, you're not gonna. I don't no, see you retiring. I don't know. Hey, I, I got know. a question for you guys. How old were you guys when you like started to pop off on YouTube? Oh, that's a good one. Uh, Eighteen. Wow, yeah. you were a baby. Literally half. You waited until ago. it was legal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, no, yeah. <laughs> that was that was yours. Your that was in oh. Six, oh, that was oh, oh, five. Five. Oh, five. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I just turned eighteen, and the Pokemon lip sync video uh, popped off. It got on the front page of YouTube, and that's, that's wild. Like ever. I think about it because I, I was around thirty when things really started taking Whoa. off for me, and I can't imagine, you know, coming out of my teens and just yeah. not knowing anything about myself and still figuring myself out, and then that happens. It was strange navigating, you know, having all these comments and people telling you what they think about you. Yeah. And you're, you're so vulnerable at 18. Right? Oh, and every, yeah. every opinion mm -hmm. matters. So that was something I had to like very quickly learn how to not take to heart. Mm -hmm. But luckily most women just call me emo or homophobic slurs. So I was like, okay. <laughs> you did get a lot of homophobic okay. slurs. Oh, for Ian, sure. Ian, not as much. You got a lot Oh, I got a lot more. He got some too. He, he did. Yeah. But uh, everyone's like, but Anthony's the gay one. <laughs> <laughs> if there's a gay one between them, it's Anthony. Off doc, uh, they say, I assume the annoying orange person has been making those videos as a requirement for a deal they took or they signed the rights away to it. Ooh. Wow, <laughs> that's that's brutal. That is brutal. That implies a lot without saying. Yeah, much. that's. I don't know. That comes from a very angry place. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Who are they? Uh, yeah. Op doc. It's a doc. Doc. <laughs> doc. doc -oc. uh, I'm sorry you feel that way, <laughs> but no, no. I mean, absolutely not. I do it because I actually like doing it. Well, you had the cartoon, and then there, there was a time when you had all the the toys and Halloween costumes and stuff, maybe it comes from a place of just seeing just how much stuff was made at certain times? Sure, I mean, there, there's always gonna be people that are like, you sold out, you did a TV show, and yeah. you know, that sort of thing. But kind of to go back to what I was saying earlier about, like, I went to school to be in film, and I, you know, like, before then, I didn't even know, like, this was a career. Mm -hmm. Like, I could make videos for a living? Holy crap, and so once, Things took off on YouTube and, you know, Orange took off. I really saw that as an opportunity. Like, hey, this is something that I love doing and I'm going to chase that. And, you know, 14, 15 years later, it's still going, which is crazy in yeah. internet, internet years. Like, yeah. talk about, like, longevity mm -hmm. for the three of us. Holy crap. That is so long. I think to it's be doing incredible this. that you could keep that series going with with enough life in it for so long, and and it's attracted hundreds of thousands of people to come back and watch every single episode. I think Dude, that's amazing. we can put faces on anything. <laughs> Name something you want a face on. I can do it. Uh, Obama shaped dildo. I'm, Obama shaped dildo. We got it. <laughs> we can do it. All right. Yeah. That'll be orange after dark. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know. You know. You know. There's an appetite for that. Yes, there is. We'll do an OnlyFans. Oh, okay. I meant yeah. this is a perfect. Set. My brother said because I said, "Do you have any question? Like any questions you want me to ask?" Mm. And he says. He remembers seeing Annoying Orange Rule 34, or is it 37? 34. 34. 34. Uh, like basically being an annoying fleshlight. <laughs> like, and, and he's a, is that, is that, I didn't, I've never there, seen. I mean, there's an appetite for anything out there. I, I do not doubt it. The annoying flashlight. Uh, oh God, I can't even. Hey, hey. <laughs> I don't know, but it's out there. <laughs> You would, you would I'll, think I'll, nothing would kill a boner faster. Because <laughs> they're there's so acidic. <laughs> I was thinking because it's annoying. It's just... Well, I mean, it's not annoying when you're doing what he described. <laughs> Brandon Rogers is actually an asshole in real life. Yeah, yeah, and it's uh, it, it, people are just gonna have to learn to live with it. Um, there's a sign in front of all my meet and greets that just says sorry. <laughs> And then as they leave, there's an array of Band-Aids, medications, all kinds of, there's ointments and stuff for to, to heal the red marks that they walk out of there with. Um, no, I, I, I abuse my fans. <laughs> not verbally, <laughs> physically. You're not a maniac. <laughs> right, right. 
It's, it, it's not full on you, assault you don't either. Hurt their feeling. And if they don't like it, um, then uh, then then uh, well, that's what therapy's for. <laughs> <laughs> Dane must be on drugs most of the time to create the annoying orange. I love how it's most of the time. <laughs> most of the time. <laughs> sober. No, I mean, like this, I, it's it's definitely not. I, you know, when I came up with orange, it was completely sober. It, apparently, this is just how I process trauma. I, <laughs> I, I don't know, putting faces on things. No. Um, you said just, people have come up to you? Yeah, I've had people come up to me and they're like, seriously though, you were stoned, right? <laughs> I always assumed they overworked themselves and never really had time for anything else. I mean, well, I mean that's yeah. not wrong. That's definitely yeah, true for a certain mean. portion of time. Yeah. You have to unlearn your hardworking tendencies, mm -hmm. and especially because that kind of stuff is, is rewarded. You're like, Oh, I've been working 60 hours a week. People are like, oh, good for you. Uh, yeah. It's like, oh, yeah. You totally. know, people, um, I think it's just it's just looked highly upon to, to overwork yourself. Yeah. So you kind of have to, to unlearn that. Plus, when, when your stuff is popping, like, it's so exciting. Yeah. And you can't wait to actually, like, stay awake and keep making stuff. And you see the results of your work. And it's like, yes. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Um, it, it can be it can be addicting for sure. I. It's hard to know when I'm like working and enjoying it and working and then like harming myself by not sleeping and working because I, I do, I get I'm sucked into yeah. it. Mm -hmm. And next thing you know, I have a day's worth of piss in me. <laughs> and um, it's crazy. And it's not yours. I don't know how it got there, but I it know. is it's how it got there. <laughs> Someone found their way to my urethra. <laughs> That's gotta be the quote of the day. <laughs> <It's>, come on. <laughs> I assume OG YouTubers cringe at their old content. Who doesn't though? I mean, the whole yeah. point of being an artist is to, I mean, I think is one of to progress, you know, year after year. There's a few gems I look back on and I go, damn, that was good. But uh, I don't know. What are, what are you? I don't know. I think there was definitely a portion of time where I was like, oh, that's cringy. But now I look back on it and I'm like, uh, I think I'm just more proud of mm -hmm. how I started, how I was doing these things, being creative, making these decisions, taking risks when I was 17, 18 years old. I think it's it's really cool to look back and see the evolution. Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I don't cringe about it really. Good. Yeah. yeah, I think that's important because it's all an evolution. It's all learning, and I think yeah. when I look at back look back at my early stuff, that's what I think too. It might be primitive, but you know what? I was learning, yeah. and in its own way, yeah. it was, you know, there's value in it. I think as we get older and the further we distance ourselves from those early, you know, we were just learning, you know, how to make videos that era. I think we will, like, we get more forgiving to it. Because oh, yeah. Like, oh, that's, you know, that's when we first started. Whereas, you know, maybe like 10 years after the fact, it's like, Ugh, like we're too yeah. close to it. And it's yeah. kind of like, I'm not that. But uh, you're right. There's there's kind of a magic to when we were first fall because you're watching yourself fall in love. And we're lucky enough to have had, had, had it on camera. You know, it, when you when you love your work, I mean, not everyone is lucky enough to have video evidence through years and decades of, of yeah. content. I assume that speaking to strangers is a weird thing to do now because that stranger could know much more about them from the start than they do. I mean, it definitely crosses my mind if someone speaks to me or reacts to my presence in a specific way. And I can't necessarily describe it, but there's like a certain look that they do or a certain thing that their mouth kind of does, like they just know who you are. They're, they're like, <laughs> there's like a little <laughs> tiny smirk that happens. And then it's usually like at the end of the interaction, they'll mention it. And it's always weird when it's like, a handyman working in my bedroom, like put, like fixing something in there for me. And then they're like, oh, by the way, I grew up watching all your videos, love it. And I'm like, oh. Yes. And like, and luckily, they, they've never been a creepy person, but there's so many offers. So there's so many creepy people out there. Dude, I don't know how many times I've had workers come over <laughs> and do the same thing. They'll see like the plaques on, oh, you know, yeah, the buttons yeah. on the wall, and they'll be like, wait, annoying? <gasps> oh my gosh. I recognize that mouth. Yep. And then they want to talk for like, you know, a half hour about their childhood and stuff like that. It's, it's fun. Yeah, yeah. I, I, no one's recognized me at all. No, I've had a couple Uber Eats drivers be like, I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm at a friend's They're house. writing down your address real I'm, quick. I, I, I don't live, I'm just <laughs> this person. I don't, I just don't know who would live in this shithole. Not me. But you know, I'm, I'm always met with, with love at least. You know, I, I will say though, the look in public when they see me and they recognize me, and I've had many chats about this with my therapist. <laughs> 
<laughs> I assume immediately that they don't like me. I assume that they're thinking yeah. homophobic thoughts or they're thinking like, like just, just they're thinking about my, what I look like or what I am. Oh, this person is, is like, like judging me. And, and then it's almost always that they recognize me. But when I see mm. them looking at me, I'm like, it's also a similar look to they're checking you out a oh. little bit because it's like a prolonged. So it's either stare. they're homophobic, mm -hmm. they're attracted to you, or they know your content. They're homophobic, they're hateful, <laughs> they're racist, they love me, want to suck me. No. <laughs> uh, it is a weird look though because it's not natural. When they're all that same person, that's the real weird part. Then, then you know <laughs> you got a good video on it. Go back to vlogging. I assume that they all feel like they have to constantly change what they do to fit themselves into a new category to constantly fit with what's popular at the time. Yeah, I feel like in, uh, what we make is pretty timeless. You yeah. can watch it at any time period. It's not like we really, I mean, well, you'll do parody. I mean, well, we all, we've all yeah, done parody. Uh, yeah, I mean, actually, I guess we ran into this recently when Ian and I were writing like a fake commercial to advertise a fake product. Mm -hmm. And our go-to in the past would have been like an infomercial parody, but that's, yeah, you don't see infomercials, so it's right. not really like in the zeitgeist. So we, we took a different approach and we were like, oh, it's gonna be like a, medication or drug ad uh, commercial parody instead. Like, So we've ha definitely had to flip some of the ideas that we would have done before and be like, what's the modern take on it? Yeah. But I don't really feel the pressure to like, keep up with, with uh, like what's trendy now because I feel like that just falls out of trend. YouTubers can't be professional actors. I have had problems getting cast and stuff specifically because by definition, I am an influencer. Oh, oh, they're like, you're not to be taken seriously. Right, let alone the fact that like, really what I am, I'm a filmmaker, I'm a comedian, I'm a writer, I'm an actor, I'm, I'm yeah. really, but because the medium in which we're all on is, you know, it's YouTube, that's where right. that's- um, the Not taken as seriously. Right, and yeah. then there, and, and whereas during, um, the like the 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 Fred you know like the Fred movie the Smosh there was a time when like oh you you are an influencer here's a ton of money makeup and even I, I had a show called Magic Funhouse and that was on full screen when they had a, like there was a time when being an influencer was like a money maker mm -hmm. and now it's like like oh yeah this movie's casting but they didn't want to face that people would recognize because they would just see the influencer or they would just see it's not the it, we're, we're want, not wanting to take away from the story or they want I don't know I've had a million reasons why like. Nah, but you're an influencer, so we're not going to give you the part. So um, it has people, especially people back home, they assume, oh, yeah, you're famous on the Internet. You must have no problem getting a role in a show or something. And I audition all the time. I have probably more trouble now than before I was super big. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, I, I, there, was a, there was a long period of time where I was really wanting to be an actor in traditional things. I think it was out of a little bit of fear of like, what happens if YouTube fails? What happens if Smosh fails? Uh, but now I don't feel that as much. I'm, I'm perfectly happy making stuff on YouTube, on the internet, and, and that's okay. I feel like for a long period of time, it was like, ooh, okay, but you know, this is just a stepping stone to go to traditional yeah. media. You better go to traditional media. That's the goal. She Be Here assumes that OG YouTubers are so restricted by how suffocating audiences can be. Hmm. I haven't felt that personally. To be. The only thing that I can think of for myself anyways is <laughs> with Orange, there's kind of a natural evolution of, you know, Watching the first episode, it's just, it's very short, very simple. But then as time goes on, you want to introduce characters and backstories and things like that. And I, for, you know, some of my audience is like, hey, we really want you to go back and do what you did before. And then when mm -hmm. you do that, then the other half of the audience is like, we want you to do new stuff. Yeah, you start, mm -hmm. you start creating like factions among yeah. your own fan base. And that's just the natural yeah. evolution of growing a fan base. You're gonna start growing people with different opinions. And especially mm -hmm. when you've been yeah. doing it for as long as we have, you know, you do this for 17, 18 years. Yeah. This spans an entire generation. There's going to be people that like different things. Mm -hmm. And there's gonna be people that say, I love what you're doing now, or I hate what you're doing now. And I don't know, I, I feel like I don't necessarily let that dictate what I, choose to make. It's just like a gut feeling that you kind of go with. Please, can you talk to Brandon about Hell of a Boss and how it's a change to his usual content with the more heartfelt scenes? Yeah, well, I, I've always loved, uh, a lot of my long form stuff, my series has drama in it. And I always thought that, that humor and drama can be married a lot better than you see on a lot of primetime television shows. And Hell of a Boss is, is 
an extension of that belief. It's a, the fact that you have these characters that are at first perceived to be two-dimensional and outlandish and bombastic, but then as the episodes go on, you find that the problems they have are very real and adult and relatable to a lot of people, especially a lot of people who don't feel represented by a lot of mainstream media. You know, the show is very, uh, it deals with uh, problems that are a little bit more unique. And so these are stories I've been wanting to tell for a long time, but now we have the means to animate them and to make, you know, to do things that I could never do on my channel while I can do in this world of hell of a boss because I'm allowed creative freedom and it's animation so you can accept extras. Background people cost the same in both animation and in live action. They're a pain in the ass. Any scene with background people, um, why am I talking about this? <laughs> there, there was there was a lot of positivity around Hell of a Boss in, yeah. in our comments. A lot of people were really liking the content. It's you know I I, I love it too, and I'm not just saying that because I'm part of the show. I love I it's it's a show that uh, normalizes a lot of queer struggles in a way that you don't feel like you're being spoon fed um, a, a problem that you might not necessarily relate to. But I think a lot of people do relate to the problems, and they don't have a lot of shows that have characters going through these struggles. And it's funny, you sprinkle, like, humor is the cheese of comedy. You can just sprinkle it on anything and it just goes down easier. Hyper Baroque says, I assume Annoying Orange is the type of person who brings their own toothbrush and toothpaste and body wash when they visit someone's house, even if they don't expect to stay the night. <laughs> <laughs> what the f Oh, boy, I, you know, I, I don't even know what that means, really. But I will say... No, no, not if I'm not, if I'm not gonna spend the night, no. No, definitely not. Are you talking about the character or Dane? Orange definitely wouldn't. He wouldn't care. He would just roll in and do his thing, like. I'm not gonna lie, I brought my toothbrush and toothpaste to here. To, to, to here. <laughs> So this should be an yeah, assumption the wrong for you. Person. I definitely, well, I want to say if you do that, I do that too, so it's okay. Oh, but, but then you learn that <laughs> then I learned that that's do just that. weird. So, 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 <laughs> so you're like, me neither. <laughs> oh, me too. Yeah, I would never do that. I never brush my teeth. <laughs> OG YouTubers have become worried about what YouTube is becoming and that their content might get phased out. I'm not dealing with that. I feel like maybe five or six years ago that was that there was that worry because things were shifting a lot and the the algorithm started favoring and pushing longer and longer content. Mm -hmm. And when we're making stuff that's highly scripted and and just in the, the manner that we do it, the content ends up being shorter. So there it added that element of thinking, you know, especially with Smosh, we have other channels that can create longer content. So so I feel safe in that regard that we're making the short content, we're making the long content. Mm -hmm. But I'm not necessarily worried about it now. I feel like YouTube has kind of gotten to a place where they're able to serve the content to the people that want to see yeah. what it is that you create. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say it's it's a well-oiled machine right now. I'm not, uh, they are not paying me to, well, of course they're paying me. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it is though, because we we lived through adpocalypse. We lived yep. through the, all these different eras yeah. of like you got to do this to make, get views. You got to do this to get. Even views. the introduction of the algorithm was a big shift. Yes, in 2013, mm -hmm. 2014. Mm -hmm. oh, and man. then there was classes, as if there was a set way to do it. And then we realized every year everything changes, and then it's like they're pushing long form content. Right yeah. now they're pushing short now form. It's short. Now, yeah. now it's now I can't make stuff short enough. That's you know. And <laughs> yeah. I, what I learned really is that we're all on tectonic plates. The rules are made up. Points aren't real. And it's just like what what has what has lasted the test of time. And I'm serious. It, what's going to get the most views? Nothing like that matters anymore because it might not yeah. get that might not be around next year. By the time you upload the video, the rules might be changed. Mm. So I feel like the stuff that is good on my channel has stood the test of time. Videos that I made in 2009, 2010, that were just like inherently good that I put a lot of effort into. And you know, those have remained, you know, they still bring in new views today, but any video that at the time I was trying to make it to serve the algorithm, you can see that it's, that's the driving force. Yeah. Of it. Mm -hmm. I think we do a pretty good job, I think, uh, pivoting to, you know, kind of like talking about those big changes that happen. And that's kind of what we have to do as creators is see, okay, well, this is how the platform's changing. This is what I got to do. Now, how can I make that work for me Yeah. to make my audience happy as well? Jammy Simps wants to know what it feels like to have created so many people's childhoods and passions. Here it is. I was oh, waiting for this one. Okay. That'll, that'll make you feel old question. Okay. <laughs> but it's so genuine, though. It like, is, I, yeah. I don't know how many times I've uploaded, like, an old video or, you know, something like that where it's you know redo an old video or put something up on 
Instagram, TikTok, whatever. Mm -hmm. And all the comments are like, this man was my childhood. And yeah. I was, I'm like, as much as that makes you feel old, it's like, oh. That's, well, Cause that's, that's a very awesome. hard to reach place in a person to, yeah. to, to be able to like nestle into their their child your, your their childhood is such a the, the nucleus of their soul and mm -hmm. like you have if you have a place in that part of a person that's huge it is huge because it's like then you think about people that raised us you know yeah. on TV yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. it's funny because as a kid those people that meant so much to me for some reason I felt like they knew it or like they yeah. like they they just expected it but now being on the opposite side of that it's like I don't. It surprises me every time, especially it happens a lot in person even. Someone will be like, oh my God, you know, you made my childhood or I watched you all the time. You were the common thing that me and my siblings could bond over. And mm -hmm. you know, like, I've even had people be like, I met my wife because we talked about and bonded over your videos. Yeah, that's huge. And that, it, it always catches me off guard. And I have no idea how to respond to it. I think there's a part of me that doesn't want to fully acknowledge it because it's so much it's, yeah i had it's heavy i had a, a woman email me this was years ago and she talked about how her husband had a terminal disease the only thing that would make him laugh was watching annoying orange videos wow. and up until up until he passed away like that was the thing like he just always wanted to watch annoying orange videos Dude, I read that email and just bawled yeah. in front of the in front of the computer. That's yeah. deep. That's crazy. Like you can't even imagine how your stuff touches people. That's that you know that's an assumption actually. People think that what we it's more than just comedy what we do. It's yeah, because cause YouTube is so pocket sized and so easy to pull out when someone's going through a crisis. Yeah, like same with my like, like and I know you too. Like people turn to our videos in a different way than watching a TV show or going to the movies. It's mm -hmm. quick. Laughs and yep. people and people can really use it for good when they're going through a hard time. Um, I, yeah, it means just as much to me when I hear people say how they used comedy to avoid a bad situation or avoid mm -hmm. or or to make you know. To, I, I've I have people come up to me. They say you raised me, and I always joke. I I don't expect child support. <laughs> <laughs> um, fame does not equal fortune. But um, there no limos. But yeah, no li no limos. Yeah. I did not get here in a limo. <laughs> But there, yeah, it's 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 very sweet when, and especially when someone has the, like, when someone feels vulnerable enough to share that with you and open yeah. up, because not everyone does share those deep moments. And when I hear those, it is very, it's very powerful. How do you feel when people say you're an OG YouTuber? I feel like we got a VIP pass to one of the most exclusive spots in internet history. Yeah, yeah. true. Wear that shit with pride. Because not everyone can say that. People before us and people after, we hold a very sacred place in, in the timeline of, mm -hmm. of the internet. And uh, we were like the first wave of, I mean, there was MySpace celebrities and other like versions of internet, but we were like the, YouTube celebrities were like the first version of internet. And then you have like TikTokers and Instagram. And, but but uh, to be a YouTuber, that was a coveted, coveted thing. I kind of wear it as a badge of honor. I think yeah. it's yeah. really cool just to, to, uh, to say that I, I was there since the beginning before you could even make money on this mm -hmm. platform. Mm -hmm. And it really was just a place for, expressing yourself and, and being creative and connecting with the community. And, and it's really cool to see how much it's grown. Mm -hmm. And to know that my heart is in it in the same way that it was then before money was involved, I think it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of cool to, to know that for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah that, that you have that longevity ahead of you. When I was a kid, I mean, if I knew that this was a career path, I wouldn't have done shit. I wouldn't have gotten anything. I wouldn't have done my homework. I would have just been like, I'm, I don't know how kids are still doing their algebra that this is a career path. Because <laughs> they know that they could be doing <laughs> this. This is an option. How are kids, how are teachers getting any homework uh, done? I think people though, there is a misconception though, or an assumption about, uh, they see where we are and they think like, well, how do I just get there? And the way that, at least I feel like us, the way that we got where we are is very, very, you know, we got here to a very, in a very specific path. I'd say we only got here because we didn't see this as a destination. No, right. we were just playing Yeah, in the, in the yeah. sandbox. Yeah. yeah, it's daunting. I think when you look at someone who has reached a destination that you want to reach as well, it's daunting when you work backwards and look at all the little steps that it took to get there. You yeah. wanna, you kinda wanna skip a lot of those steps and just get there. Yeah. But I think all those little steps are required in order for you to get here. And, and you have to, for us, it started off with just playing and creating stuff that brought us joy. Mm -hmm. And it just so happened to resonate with people and bring them joy as well. And it was like one teeny tiny step. 
each day.